Lord be with you. It's Jim Moore, it's good to be back. We've been in 1 John. So, last week we looked at chapter 1. This week we're going to go, hopefully make it through chapter 2. Last week we looked at that, uh, that very controversial passage, 1 John 1, 9. I want to go back on that, just a little bit of refresher. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. The obvious question that we pose, what if we, what if we don't confess? What if we forget some of our sins? I mean, how many sins have we committed versus how many do we confess? Those numbers should match up, but, you know, they don't. So what's going on in 1 John, especially 1 John 1, 9? Now, remember, this is just a little refresher here. John says, uh, he writes in chapter 1, so that his audience can have fellowship. But he says, I, I write these things so that you can have fellowship and indeed our fellowship is with the Father. So John's audience here in chapter 1 is people who don't have fellowship. They don't yet have fellowship. They're, they're lost. They're unsaved. That's why they need to stop denying their sin and get total cleansing, total forgiveness. If you've been born again, saved, I use those terms right there, then you're, you're in Christ. You already have total forgiveness. You already have total cleansing, and, and it's not dependent upon your confession. Yes, confession is good. Confession is, is healthy. We, we would agree with God. That's what the word is, confession, homo logeo, homo logos, okay? Uh, say the same thing as, but my words don't make Jesus die again. We, we forget that sometimes. The only remission of sin is the shedding of blood, okay? I mean, that, that's it. Serious business. And Jesus already died. He died once and for all. And that's it. He's not died again. You've been forgiven. You've been born again. We're forgiven how many times? Once and for all. And another thing that chapter 1 addressed, uh, those who didn't believe that Jesus came in the flesh, that he, that he was a real person, a real man. They thought he was some ghost or figment, you know. John says, we handled him, we heard him, we saw him, our, our hands, they, they touched him. John was writing in the first chapter to correct that heresy. And then we also see in chapter 1 the difference between uh, uh, the contrast between light, which means saved, and darkness, which means unsaved. And we'll see that as we go on in our, in our study here. There were people claiming to be light, but they were darkness. They were saying that they walked in the light, but then they said, hey, we got no sin. We've never sinned. And they were making God out to be a liar because... Uh, they did this because they were lost, yet they were claiming to be saved. So John is saying, what's the solution for them? You know, he says, us here, remember we, we, we talked about that last week, he's been polite. He says, if we confess our sins, he forgives us and cleanses us of how much unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. Now I want to make a point here. He forget, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Now listen, it's not one by one. That's Catholic style. You know, you go to a little booth one by one. I'm not going to leave them alone. How about, how about us on the other side? And it's not coming down the aisle for some altar call. Protestant style. Okay, you got Catholics, you got Protestants. They both got their own way here. But this is once and for all cross style. I want to throw that in there. Cross style. It's God's cross 
that enables us to be forgiven. The cross of Jesus Christ once and for all. Cross style. I want you to get that. Not altar call style. Not confession booth style. The cross. It is finished style. Chapter 1 addressed those who were unwilling to confess that they were sinners. They, they denied their sin. And then it addressed this part too, uh, which we went over into 2 John, verses 1 and 2. I won't read those verses right now, but uh, if you're a Christian, you have the truth in you, and he says, forever. So how long is it in you? Forever. And the truth is a person named Jesus Christ who said, I am the truth. And these people that John is addressing here that don't have fellowship, they don't have the truth in them. Now, there's a purpose behind all this, and, and we've got thousands and thousands of Bible teachers saying that we're forgiven, that we're cleansed, but we need to ask to be forgiven. Now, which is it? We're forgiven and cleansed, or, or do we need to ask to be forgiven and cleansed? And they'll go on to say, well, you're, you're, I've heard people talk, I don't even know what words they use, but we're forgiven and cleansed eternally, but not in the real world unless we confess every sin. Boy, I tell you what, uh, you know, I hear some people talking, boy, I mean, just, just think, you know, here I am, born again, uh, born again believer, and I, I have a slip up, I have a mess up, I don't know, uh, uh, yeah, just I, I, I'm thinking out loud here. You know, the the people that can make you the angriest is probably your kids or, or you know people that are closest to you. Let's just say, for example, here you are, a born again believer, and and your kid does some bonehead move, and you get all angry, and now pff, you forgot to confess you sinned and you forgot to confess it, and now you've been a you've been a born again believer for 50 years, and one little mess up wiped it all out. Man, that doesn't, that's not an anchor to my soul. Jesus is an anchor to my soul. Now it's dependent on me? No way. We, we've got this half Protestant, half Catholic message going on here. This, this hybrid that's so popular and it makes God a double talker. You know, a double talker. He says, well, he says on one side of his mouth, your sins and iniquities I will remember no more. But I remember them unless you, I, I, and, you know, I'll remember them up until you confess them. Your sins and iniquities, I will remember no more. You're cleansed, but it's up to you to stay cleansed. That's all double talk. It's, it's not true, okay? Let me just say that. It's not true. And this 1 John 1, 9 here has been the verse of, of such controversy, and, and, and it produces all this double talk. That's why it's so important to see who it's written to and what these people that John's writing to were claiming. They were claiming sinless perfection that they had never seen. They were claiming sin isn't even real. I heard some teachers last week teaching that sin isn't even real. John is saying, please come to your senses and confess your sins and you'll be like us and you'll, you'll have fellowship with, with us and fellowship with the Father and we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So if you will be like us, and then he will forgive you and cleanse you of, of what? All unrighteousness. There it is again, all. Not little by little, once and for all. Cross style. Christians have been forgiven. It's past tense. There's no ifs about it. So he's, and he says, I'm writing to you little children because your sins have been forgiven you. For Why? We, we went over this last week. For his name's sake. Same author, same letter. He's writing to little children, and that's us, past tense, that we have been forgiven. Now that poses a question, which we've talked about before. Do you think you're going to sin more because you've been forgiven? Well, people are sinning just fine right now. People are scared they're going to, uh, they're falling out of fellowship. 
thinking, well, I'm close to God, I'm not close to God, I'm close to God, I'm not I'm close, I'm distant, I'm close, I'm distant. All that kind of thinking does is breed sin. Because if you believe you're distant from God, what, how are you going to live? How are you going to act? Distant from God. If you believe that you're dirty, no good, how are you going to live? Dirty and no good. That's why the scriptures tells us in 2 Peter that if we lack godly qualities, we have forgotten our cleansing. So remembering our cleansing leads to godly living. Forgetting our cleansing leads to sinning. That's why God has, has done this. It's called the new covenant. What is it? Christ in you. So confess, yes, agree with God when you've done wrong. We call that confession, say the same as. Yeah, yeah, we agree. Yeah, he pointed that out. Yes, I did do wrong. So, and what do we do there? We turn from that. We call that repentance, re, you know, change of mind, change of mind. I see that I've done wrong. I, 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 I go, I do a 180, I turn, I go in total dependence upon Christ Jesus. But my 180 here, my repentance doesn't cause Jesus to die again. Remember, without the shedding of blood, there's no repentance of sin. He's not going to go back and die anymore. Doesn't bring any more blood to take away my sins. My 180 just makes sense. It's just logos, logical. Why? Because I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus and Christ lives in me. He made me new for a reason. Why? What, what's the reason? So that I can walk in newness of life. That's the reason. That's the sense of it all. So that we can walk in newness of life. So let, And let's not forget here that we have been forgiven. That's past tense. And why? I'll say this one more time. For us, yeah, it's really, really good. But for his namesake. The Father wanted to show off. You know, we, we said this last week. He wanted to show off just how much he could do. Adam comes in and, and sins and ruins it for us. All creation fell. The entire creation fell. And God said, I'll reverse it all, plus it'll be even better. And you, you can read this, you know, Romans 5, how much do we enjoy this abundance of grace that's been lavished on us? Lavished on us so much that the, it, Paul says the grace wherein we stand, we stand in grace. We stand in it because God has poured out his Holy Spirit on us and in us. And he, he did that once and for all. And, and, and that's it. It's done. It's over. It's finished. He dwells in us. So today we, we're going to pick up on chapter 2. Perfected in his love, I would call it. First John is about love. He just keeps going back and back to the importance, the centrality of loving one another. Boy, isn't that a message that we need? It's more than a message. It's a person. But isn't that what we need now more than, than anything? Love, the centrality of loving one another. And in fact, it, it's... It's not your Bible preaching. It's not your witnessing. It's not your Bible study, how much you go to church. That's a mark of a person that is in Christ. It's much deeper than that. What is it? This is how the world will know that you're my disciples. This is how the world will know you belong to me. How? That we love one another. That we love one another. I would love to see churches unite. Oh, my goodness, can't get along for a dinner. I'm talking, you know, Churches come together. There's so much that we could do in our communities and, and all kinds of things. Uh, love to see it. Love to see it. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus Christ the right. My little children. Why does he say my little children? What, I mean, first, uh, what was chapter, who was chapter one for? Well, chapter one was, well, if the shoe fits, wear it. You've been, you've been claiming this stuff. You need to stop claiming that stuff but you, so that you could be like us and have fellowship. It was darkness and light and darkness and light. But now he says, my little children. He's clarifying who he's talking to. He's talking to believers in, in Jesus Christ. Okay? Believers in Jesus Christ. I'm writing these things to you so that 
you may not sin. And if you do, we have an advocate with the Father. See, there's a false teaching out there that says Christians never sin. People mistake total forgiveness for saying they don't commit sins anymore after salvation. That's a lie. That's, that's false teaching. And if anyone sins, and guess what? We sin. Yes, we do. We have an advocate with the Father. Okay? And he himself, verse 2, is the perpetuation for our sins. Now, who was this written to? Now, John here, the Apostle John, was a Jew. John's apostleship was to the Jew. Paul wrote to the Gentiles. John writes to the Jews. So the Jews, year after year, uh, daily, for, for centuries, they were trying to satisfy God. I mean, this goes all the way back to Moses. Moses comes down off the mountain. He's got, ten, he's got these tables of stone, ten commandments in his hand, and then he listens to God. He writes a bunch of other rules and regulations and, and the whole sacrificial system that was behind it all. And the point of it all was to propitiate God. In other words, to satisfy God. Now, Let's say that you're a Jew. We're not. We're, we're Gentiles. But let's say you was a Jew and, you, and, and your family goes back, you know, generations. You got your genealogy and uh, this Jewish family. And they've all participated in these sacrifices and ceremonies year after year after year. And they're all trying to keep God happy, all trying to satisfy God. People do that today. There's still, yet yeah, people try to satisfy God. And then you hear that this man named Jesus, this, this little guy from Nazareth here, is the total satisfying sacrifice that his entire life and death and everything was a total propitiation, the total satisfying of God. Do, do you as a Jew know what that means? That means shut the temple down. We don't need it anymore. It, it, it means if your grandma and your grandpa and your, and your mom and dads and uncles and aunts are, they're, they're telling us to, to keep going to the temple, then we've got to break away from that. Jesus said, I come to bring division. He said, I come to divide families. He, he doesn't come to bring peace but a sword. Jesus said that. Well, what's he divided? He's dividing law from grace. He's dividing temple sacrifices from his own sacrifices. He's dividing the old from the new. He's saying, let's make it clear the sacrifices can stop. The offerings are no more. My Father is satisfied. My blood is enough. Propitiation. Jesus, he did it. Now, people today... Listen to what I'm telling you. These are the actions. People sit in the church and they say, yeah, yeah, Jesus is enough. I agree with you. But we still have to ask for forgiveness. We still got to go up front to some altar call every week. And we we got we to gotta perform these ceremonies. See, the Jews were doing this stuff 2,000 years ago. Same thing. Paul dealt with them. Uh, Galatians and, and, and these other uh, things. They, uh, they would say, yeah, Jesus is a wonderful man. This is all right. But we still need to go to the temple just in case. Well... You see, it's, it's just awesome that we're totally forgiven, totally cleansed, been made righteous in, in Christ. But does Jesus plan on dying again? Because just let's not forget, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. If Jesus didn't do it the first time, you think it's going to work the second? What did he say? It is finished. That's what this passage means. That he himself is the perpetuation for our sins. He's saying it is finished. It's finished once and for all. Jesus is the once for all finished sacrifice which satisfies God, our Father, forever. Not, and then he goes on to say, not for our Now, if you take this verse out of context, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world, you get some, some crazy stuff out there, and, and one that's going on, and uh, I know a whole lot about it, is universalism. Uh, the idea that everybody's saved, uh, they just don't know it yet. Uh, there's no hell, everybody goes to heaven. Uh, which really means you can throw half the Bible out, and sin is really no big deal. God is love, and that means anything goes. 
really when you begin to see God is love, his set being is against sin. Sin is such a serious business that Jesus had to die. So, I mean, sin needs payment. And the only payment that could satisfy that, propitiate it, is the blood of Jesus. But then he goes on to say, and Paul in Romans says, that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord, see it's not for a select few, his blood is sufficient for the whole world, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord, what? Shall be saved. You, you find this radical news for an Old Testament person who has come to Christ. They, they look at this and they say, it, not for our sins only, but for the sin of the whole world. And the Jew was thinking, you mean them? And the them, let me say it, is us. Because we were the what they thought the, the dirty, low-down dogs, they called us. Sinners. They would say, I mean, that's why it was so radical. I mean, God said, I'll call the people who are not my people. They're going back to Hosea said, what? Did he really say that? Abraham will be the father of many nations? Wait a minute. I thought it was just one nation and we're it. Many nations? You mean them? Us? John says, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Verse 3, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Keep his commandments? Oh, boy. <laughs> boy, you had to throw that in there, John. See, we start a checklist. Well, commit adultery. Well, I haven't done. Well, Jesus said, if you look at a woman, oh my gosh, murder. Well, I've never done that. What well, He said, if you're angry with your brother, oh my gosh. But if you know the message of of Romans, Galatians, Colossians, Hebrews, it says this: we we died to the law. We're free from the law. We're not under the law. We're not supervised by the law. Christ is the end of the law. So, John, what in the world are you talking about? Are we to go back to Moses' law? Now in the same letter, let me flip over here, 1 John chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. John doesn't even mention the law of Moses in his, in his letter. Zero times. He just told you what the commandment is. So it ain't about Moses. It's, it's not about Moses. Jesus said a new commandment I give you. That's what John is talking about here. Now verse 4, why? The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in him. Because the love of God is not in him. The love of God, Christ Jesus, has come to dwell in us at salvation. That's what salvation is, the very presence of Christ in you. Now, I'm not saying we love people perfectly. Yes, we have imperfect performance, but imperfect performance does not change the fact that the truth is in us. The love of God is in us, and we're, we naturally love our brothers and sisters. Sometimes we rub each other the wrong way, sure, but yet still the truth is in us. Love himself lives in us. That's the evidence that we are saved. What's the evidence we're saved? Love. God love, okay? God love. Verse 5, But whosoever keeps his word in him, the love of God is truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. Don't look at what people are saying. Don't look at what people are teaching. Because there's so much junk out there, my gosh, Christian television, a lot of the stuff that's all over the place, it's just junk. Look at what people are doing. You, you, you can see so many movements that, that come out of arrogance, that come out of greed, that come out of just heresy. I'm going to tell you what makes a movement right is when, when it's God's movement and Jesus Christ is the head of it. Okay? And, and verse 6 here, The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Walk in the same manner? What does that mean? Why, Jesus walked in the water? Does that mean we've got to walk on, on the water, uh, do all the healings he did, or raise people from the dead? Jesus said, you'll do greater miracles than these. What in the world? I mean, where are they? 
Where are they? We're looking. You know, there's churches and signs and wonders and miracles and, and all of this. We want to see people raised from the dead and walking on water. Greater miracles than these, Jesus, what are you talking about? What, what's better than raising people from the dead? How can I compete with that? Well, apparently, according to John here, who the scriptures are given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so one author of the Bible named Jesus, so apparently walking in love. Love is more important to God than raising people from the dead. Walking in the love of God and sharing in the love of God, receiving the love of God is the most important miracle that you and I can participate in. Hear me again. Receiving the love of God is the most important miracle we can participate in. It's not flashy. The cameras won't roll. Oh, you won't get a lot of applause for it. It'll be at home. It'll be at work. It'll be with your kids. Nobody clapping. No cameras rolling. No billboards. Look what we did. Look at the miracles we performed. It's simple love. The greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. But I want you to know that, that, that it'll be there. There'll be a cloud of witnesses in heaven that, that'll say, Look, he threw off the sin that entangled him and he walked in love. That's what matters. And when I say love, I'm not saying people pleasers, the doormat. We, we walk in love. Let me hurry up here. Beloved, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. What? No new commandment. On the other hand, a new commandment. What? I get confused, John. John, please clarify here. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. That's what Jesus said. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. What was the old commandment? Okay, Jesus, they, they come to Jesus and then they say, okay, Jesus, tell us what is the greatest commandments in the law. Jesus name two, you remember, love the Lord your God with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said these are the greatest commandments in the law. In the law. But we are, what, free from the law. We're not under the law. God is not going back to the law and saying, you're free from the law, 98% of it, except for these two. No, he's given us a new command. A new command is not love your neighbor as yourself. The new command is, he's saying, do you know how much I love you? Then receive my love and transmit my love to other people. I mean, that's it. A new commandment I give you. Now, now, remember, his audience is Jewish here. They think of Moses. He says, love as I've loved you. Now, how in the world are we going to do that? He has indwelled us. He has shed abroad his love in our hearts. Okay? The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brothers in the darkness even until now. See, I, I told you this is not being a doormat. He shed a shed abroad his love in our hearts. There's a huge difference uh, between this love for believers and, and, and hatred. The definition of, of a believer, we walk in love. It, it's not a new legalism. Jesus said people in this world will hate you. Those are lost people. Jesus saying those who will love you are saved people. Don't, don't turn this into legalism, okay? Am I loving enough? Uh, oh, I feel saved now. No, it's not new love legalism. It's the definition of, of, of saved or lost. Who is in you? Either love or hate. I mean, that's it. Verse 10, the one who loves his brother abides in the light. There's no cause for stumbling in him. What's he mean stumbling? You'll never regret loving somebody. You'll regret bitterness. You'll regret being mean to people and treating people wrong, but you'll never regret loving people. But the one who hates his brother, let's say, I'm writing to you little children because your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you've overcome the evil one. You've already overcome the evil one. People want to cast out devils and do all this other stuff. You won't even find that in the New Testament. He lives in you. 
You belong to the Lord. You are His possession. He doesn't share. Okay? So what is God's new commandment for us? I'm going to wrap it up right here. To believe in Jesus and to love others as He has loved us. God bless you all, and we'll see you next week.